Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are awaiting the arrival of the Prime Minister and the Deputy Governor General. So please bear with us. Please stand for the arrival of the Prime Minister. Thank you. May be seated. Just a little housekeeping matters. Could you please come forward a bit, please, those sitting at the back? Yes, come forward. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you this, but please stand as I invite <laughs> Father Marcin Rumek to ask God's blessings on this evening's lecture.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of goodness, maker of heaven and earth, creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, the origin of all being. We come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this event. Help us to listen and understand. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of community. Fill us with your grace, Lord God, and continue to remind us that all that we do here today, all that we accomplish, is for the pursuit of the truth, for the greater glory of you, and for the service of humanity. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Father Marcin. I now call on Trio. Remain standing for the national anthem. Deputy Governor General and President of the Senate, Her Excellency Honorable Decima Williams, the Honorable Prime Minister Dickon Mitchell, Minister for National Security, Home Affairs, Public Administration, Information and Disaster Management, and Minister for Information, Infrastructure and Physical Development, Public Utilities, Civil Aviation, and Transportation. Senator, the Honorable Minister Claudette Joseph, Attorney General, and Minister for Legal Affairs, Labor, and Consumer Affairs. Other Cabinet Members and Members of Parliament, Dr. Justin Koo, Deputy Dean Graduate Studies, Research and Outreach, Lecture in Law at University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, our featured guest speaker. Dr. Francis Severin, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the West Indies Open Campus, who is joining us online. Mr. Ryan Bayer, Director Acting, Open Campus Countrysides, University of the West Indies Open Campus, joining us also online. Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, Deputy Director Acting, Open Campus Countrysides, University of the West Indies Open Campus. Members of the Bristol family, John and Ambassador Gillian Bristol. Mr. Lawrence, Larry Lawrence, Managing Director of Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited permanent secretaries, other senior government officials.
Father Marcin Rumek, Paris Priest, RC Church Grand Dance, Dr. Wendy Grenade, Chairman of the Board of Directors at the T.A. Marichal Community College, Dr. Ronald Brunton, Principal of T.A. Marichal Community College, Mr. Robert Branch, Register of Corporate Affairs and Intellectual Property Office, members of the Grenada Bar Association, members of the Planning Committee of the Grenada Cultural and Creative Industry Conference, specially invited guests and presenters at the conference, the creatives, staff at the UWI Open Campus, staff at Corporate Affairs and Legal Affairs, student lecturers and alumni of the University of the West Indies, St. George's University and the TAMCC, principal, teachers and students of secondary schools, the members of the media, guests joining us online. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good evening again. I am happy to see so many of you here today. My name is Mrs. Keisha Comis Young Branch, and I am the head acting of the UE Open Campus Grenada and your chair for this evening's lecture. Welcome to the eighth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you. <laughs> Our theme for this year's lecture is using intellectual property tools to create value for entrepreneurs in the creative industry, women and IP, accelerating innovation and creativity. At this time, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, the Deputy Director Acting of UE Open Campus Countryside to make her welcome remarks. Dr. Dow. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A special warm good evening to Decima Williams and the Prime Minister and our wonderful ministers, but the list is exceedingly long, so I will move right into telling you welcome. The University of the West Indies Open Campus Grenada warmly welcomes you to this, the eighth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. This is a very memorable lecture for us this year as we celebrate at UWI 75 years of being the premier tertiary institution in the Caribbean. Indeed, we are ranked first in the Caribbean and in the top 5% in the world for excellence. We celebrate the UWI's Diamond Jubilee under the theme, Rooted, Ready, and Rising. We are rooted in our rich Caribbean heritage. We are ready to meet the challenges and rising to new opportunities and pathways to lifelong learning. This year, we focus our attention on the field of the orange economy. This economy focuses on our intangible creative resource. The theme chosen forms part of UWI's mandate to stand ready to meet the needs of our community. Through this lecture, we provide the avenue to investigate and interrogate the topic using intellectual property tools to create value for entrepreneurs in the creative industry. We warmly welcome our feature speaker this afternoon, Dr. Justin Koo, WIPO Regional Consultant and Lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus. We have found in Dr. Koo the embodiment of a Caribbean intellectual. He has focused on copyright law with interests in intellectual property, sports law, and legal research skills. We are truly grateful for him to, uh, for acquiescing to our request. We wish to sincerely thank our sponsor, 
Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited for parting with us for yet another year. Grenada Cooperative Bank has made and continues to make outstanding contributions to community development in the fields of education, sports, health, social services, culture, and the environment. We look forward to your continued support in the future. This year, we have collaborated with the government of Grenada through its Corporate Affairs and Intellectual Property Office and the Grenada Office of Creative Affairs. This lecture is in the honor of Mr. Carol Bristol QC for his exemplary service to the university. We very specially welcome John Bristol and Ambassador Gillian Bristol and other members of the Bristol family who are joining us online. It gives me great, great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you. The Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited has been a major co-sponsor and sponsor for this lecture since its inception. Please join me in welcoming the Managing Director of Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited, Mr. Larry Lawrence, to make some brief remarks. Protocol having already been established, I stand on that. Very pleasant good afternoon. Welcome one, welcome all. Permit me to start by saying it gives me great pleasure to be here for the second consecutive year to deliver remarks at this very special occasion. On behalf of the Board of Directors, the management and staff of the Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited, I wish to extend congratulations to the University of the West Indy Open Campus for hosting this year's Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. The bank is very pleased once again to be associated with this event. Support for educational development has been one of the main areas of the bank's community development over the years. We always aspire to bring cultural, historical, and intellectual awareness to our communities. Being the only indigenous bank on the island, we are conscious of the role that we must play in the holistic development of our communities. I must say the team for this year's lecture using intellectual property tools to create value for entrepreneurs in the creative industry, and I repeat, using intellectual property tools to create value for entrepreneurs in the creative industry. Women and IP, accelerating innovation and creativity is very intriguing. We are confident that Dr. Justin Koo, our WIPO's consultant, faculty of law at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, our feature presenter, will enlighten us on this topic. And at the end, we will all have a greater appreciation for the value this industry and the benefits that can be derived therefrom. In addition, it is important to understand how we can commercialize our ideas or monetize our ideas so that we are justly rewarded for our ingenuity as a society. We therefore invite everyone in this evening's lecture and discussions which promises to be edifying and very thought-provoking. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence, and we do appreciate the support over the years. 
This year's lecture, as stated before, is in collaboration with the government of Grenada through the Corporate Affairs and Intellectual Property Office and the Grenada Office of Creative Affairs. I am therefore pleased to introduce to you Senator the Honorable Claudette Joseph, Minister for Legal Affairs, Labor, Consumer Affairs, and Attorney General to make her brief remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson, Dr. Decima Williams, President of the Senate and Acting Governor General, Honorable Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell, our beloved. <laughs> Might I also specially recognize the Honorable Lennox Andrews, Minister for Economic Development Planning Tourism, the ICT, the Creative Economy, and the other portfolios in the super ministry. And I hope my, well, there's only other one, one other cabinet colleague, so I will specially mention him too. <laughs> the Energizer Bunny, Honorable Andy Williams, um, MP for this constituency and uh, Minister for Mobilization, Implementation and Transformation. Might I also recognize other senior government officials, and please pardon me if I single out our permanent secretary in the Ministry of Legal Affairs, Labor, and Consumer Affairs, under which Kaipo falls, and Mr. Robert Branch, Registrar of Kaipo, other members of the Diplomatic Corps, Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, head of the UE Open Campus, Dr. Justin Ku, our featured speaker, welcome to Grenada. I hope you come back to do the diving soon. Yes. <laughs> members of the media, other creatives, my members of my second family, I bet a lot of people didn't know that. <laughs> Ambassador Gillian Bristol and John, representing the Bristol family. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. So this morning when we were here at the opening of the two-day conference um, on the um, creative and cultural industries in Grenada, Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell charged all stakeholders, the business community, the education sector, Kaipo, creatives, everybody, to acknowledge and embrace our collective responsibility to form a strong ecosystem around the creative industry, this new sector we are building as a pillar of economic growth and wealth creation for the ordinary but talented and gifted Grenadian man and woman and child as well. This evening's activity is an indication that, in a sense, we preempted that call from Prime Minister Mitchell and are already collaborating. And is a perfect example that, um, of what can be achieved when stakeholders work together towards our development agenda. This evening's activity brings together the government of Grenada through the Corporate and Intellectual Property Office and the Office of the Creative Affairs, sorry, yes, the Office of the Creative Affairs, our education sector through the University of the West Indies Open Campus, the private sector through one of our main sponsors and the premier sponsor of this event every year, the Grenada Cooperative Bank, the United Nations through the World Intellectual Property Organization, and creatives and other people in the creative sector. 
For us at the Ministry of Legal Affairs, this evening's lecture is an opportunity for the Corporate and Intellectual Property Office to engage in public education in what is expected to be Kaipo's largest public education activity for 2023 and the culmination of three weeks of activities marking World IP Day, which is celebrated annually worldwide on April 26th. It is also part of the manifestation of Kaipo taking its place front and center as a key stakeholder in this new sector of growth, the creative industry. Today's lecture um, has its genesis in the UWI campus asking Kaipo for help in identifying a speaker for its annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series, which has always been supported by the Grenada Cooperative Bank. Of course, we were only too happy to oblige as Mr. Bristol was one of our most distinguished legal luminaries and a personal mentor of Mr. Branch, the Registrar of Kaipo, and of course myself. Mr. Br Mr. Bristol got me into law. When it was discovered that the lecture was scheduled to be delivered on the opening day of this creative industry conference, it made perfect sense for UWE, Kaipo, and the Office of Creative Affairs to work together to make it happen. And so a uh, collaboration was born. The theme of this evening's lecture is most appropriate as we recall Mr. Bristol, in whose honor this lecture is named, being one of the leading intellectual property lawyers in Grenada. His firm, Henry, Henry, and Bristol, being a leading trademark and patent agent in this jurisdiction up to today. Our government's new thrust to promote the creative industry includes the leveraging of the Office of Creative Affairs and Kaipo to engage and encourage creatives in the sector to protect their brands, symbols, inventions, by registering their intellectual property at Kaipo. The creative industry has become a new engine of growth and wealth creation in developing countries, and Grenada is at the cusp of claiming its share of the pie. The government launched Grenada's first ever development fund, which will provide much needed resources to local creatives and businesses that exports products and services, and from February 1st, 2023, people in the creative sector began to benefit from 100% concession on duties and taxes when importing selected tools of trade. The ministry, I think you should give me a clap for that. Thank you. The Ministry of Legal Affairs has been working to enhance Grenada's legislative framework as it relates to intellectual property rights and the protection of those rights. We are working on an updated trademark um, act and also a patent act together with regulations. We are also revising draft legislation for industrial designs and geographical indications. This all support government's new thrust for, cre for the creative economy and the Ministry of Legal Affairs has been in this regard engaging CARI Forum, the CARI Forum Intellectual Property and Innovation Project to assist with this work. In order to align the legislative agenda with innovation and provide legal certainty for local businesses, the Ministry of Legal Affairs intends to conduct consultations on the Hague system of international registration of industrial designs. This service provides a practical business solution 
by allowing applicants to register up to 100 designs in 96 countries by filing one single application. In addition to these initiatives, I am pleased to announce this evening that the government of Grenada has recently signed a cooperation agreement between the Corporate and Intellectual Property Office and the World Intellectual Property Organization. And in this regard, I ask you to give Mr. Robert Branch a round of applause. <laughs> this agreement covers cooperative services for the improvement of intellectual property business, um, businesses, services that are offered at KAIPO, including the provision of business systems by WIPO for IP rights administration, document management, online services, data search, and any related systems or modules. Projects for digitization, data capture, and data quality improvement, creation of national and or regional IT basic databases. A noteworthy aspect of this cooperation agreement is, the provisions, is that provisions are made for capacity building and sustainable and, and sustain, sustainability and includes training and knowledge transfer. WIPO will transfer all necessary knowledge to the office staff to enable them to perform the local support system. In practical terms, this new system will make it easier for our creatives to use intellectual property tools to protect their creations. I almost wanted to stick in women there, and I'll do it anyway. Make it easier for women too, because we are focusing on women in IP. And that includes the woman from Grand Anse to Leapers Hill. <laughs> WIPO Business Solutions is a comprehensive package that offers invaluable support for our creatives it offers a single online platform for registering trademarks and industrial designs, as well as providing an end-to-end -end service to facilitate the automated registration process. So we are well on the way, moving step, um, in step, I should say, with the Office of the Creative Affairs being fully aware of what we need to do to strengthen the legislative framework as we move forward into this new sector. So, in conclusion, I wish to recognize and on behalf of the government and people of Grenada, thank all the stakeholders who work together to make this lecture possible. The University of the West Indies Open Campus for agreeing to co collaborate with Kaipo and to feature intellectual property as the theme for this year's Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. I congratulate all, you also on its 75th anniversary milestone. And I don't think I need to say that the Prime Minister and I are graduates of you. <laughs> the Office of Creative Affairs for allowing the lecture to be one of the main features of the conference that has taken place over these two days, and I wish the office every success for the remainder of the conference. This morning was fantastic. The World Intellectual Property Organization for facilitating the participation of Dr. Ku. WIPO is a reliable partner in the protection and promotion of a balanced system of intellectual property. I also recognize and thank the Grenada Cooperative, um, Cooperative Bank for its continued support and sponsorship in this lecture series, a key feature in public education in Grenada. And of course, Mr. Branch and the staff at WIPO. Sorry, KAIPO, you haven't reached WIPO yet, KAIPO. <laughs> I congratulate you for the successful staging of the world IPD 2023, and I must here add that this year is the first time in the history of WIPO, and Grenada became party to WIPO in 1998, I believe, and 
IEP Day is celebrated every year, and this year is the first year that we actually celebrated World IP Day and did it over three weeks. So congratulations again to the Grenada Office of Creative Affairs for showcasing authentic Grenadian innovation and creativity. Let us continue to work together to develop and enhance the creative industry. For in doing so, we will create new areas of gainful employment and wealth creation for our people. We will educate our young children on the importance of creativity and uh, the lucrative nature of it as well. And we will make Grenada even more attractive to our nationals in the diaspora and of course to non-nationals who want to make Grenada um, their second home. And so all of us will be able to join hearts and hands in this transformational development agenda that we are pursuing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Joseph, fellow alumni, for enlightening us on the alignment of education with legal affairs and the benefits of intellectual property to creatives and Grenada. I now call on Mr. Robert Branch, Registrar for Corporate Affairs and Intellectual Property Office, to introduce our featured speaker and to moderate the rest of the program. It's a very long protocol, it's, it's uh, three pages, and I have to find the right entry point. <laughs> and I have to recognize the Acting Governor General, uh, Your Excellency, Honorable Dr. Decima Williams, and I must recognize the Prime Minister, Honorable Deacon Mitchell, uh, other members of Cabinet, and I have to recognize the Bristol family, Ambassador Julian Bristol and Sir John Bristol. I am surprised that the Attorney General remembered that Mr. Bristol was indeed my mentor um, when I went to Cave Hill and had to transition to law school. Um, there was a requirement that you do um, in service with the firm, and Mr. Bristol graciously agreed to let me do the in service. So it's a um, great memory. The first time I learned about trademarks was in Mr. Bristol's chambers because the intellectual property wasn't then a program that was lectured at the university. It's only subsequent to me leaving UB that I recall intellectual property being a program that was lectured. To introduce Dr. Koo. Dr. Justin Koo is a lecturer and deputy dean for graduate studies, research, and outreach at the Faculty of Law, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Prior to joining the University of the West Indies, Justin was a visiting lecturer at King's College London and a teaching fellow at University College London. Justin obtained his LLB from the University of Kent in 2011. He then completed his LLM in Intellectual Property Law at King's College London in 2012. Following this, he completed his PhD at King's College London in 2016. The thesis comprised the title, quote, The Proper Scope of the Communication to the Public Right in EU copyright law, unquote. Resulting from his thesis was the book, 
quote, the right to communication to the public in EU copyright law, unquote. Published by Hart Publishing in May 2019, which was subsequently cited by the Court of Justice of the European Union in the Advocate General's opinion in the YouTube case. Justin's primary research interest is focused on copyright law. Justin also has teaching interests in intellectual property law, trademark law, entertainment law, sports law, and legal research skills. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm Grenada welcome to Dr. Justin Koo. Good evening, everyone. Um, please allow me to observe all protocols as they were before. The um, list is quite long, um, and I'm kind of excited to get into my lecture. <laughs> um, for those of you who would have seen the picture up on the, um, the flyer, you'd realize I'm wearing the exact same outfit. Um, the reason for that is this is my sort of very lame, maybe dad joke, uh, icebreaker. Um, so you get the real version of me, not the counterfeit version. Um, or not the, as we're talking about it today, the AI version or the hologram version of me. So it's the, you know, the real, the real flesh and blood version of me. Uh, so the topic that I'm going to talk about today is using intellectual property tools to create value for entrepreneurs in the creative industry. And I want to also highlight throughout this, using the examples that I will refer to, the uh, importance of having women contribute to the creative economy as well. Um, the fact is, as a matter of fact, um, persons, persons have done research to show that in particular in relation to patents, women are seriously underrepresented in the registration of patents. And perhaps that stems directly from the fact that a lot of the areas that involve patent law are heavily male-dominated areas, medicine, traditionally. Um, I know these things are changing now, engineering, computer science, data science. So the fact is that we need to do better to empower our women in our society, Caribbean-wide, uh, to be able to uh, create and not just create, protect, and commercialize their intellectual property. So what I'm going to go through today is a lot about what is IP, because for those of you who were here earlier today and for those of you joining in the audience for the first time for the day, we mention the word IP all the time. Intellectual property is probably becoming a buzzword. Uh, for those of you who may be involved in startups, um, you will realize the importance of intellectual property. And the reality is that even though IP is in our face all the time and we're all creators here in some form or fashion, a lot of us still don't necessarily know the basics of intellectual property law. So I want to start with that. I want to have a look at what is IP? Why is IP important? What do we do with it? Sort of the who, what, where, why, how about IP? So at the end of today's lecture, if nothing else, if you take nothing else home, you at least know what a copyright is, a trademark is, and a patent is. And that puts you 99% ahead of everyone else out there who don't know, who don't, or rather wouldn't know, or didn't have the opportunity to learn properly about what is intellectual property. And for those of you, if your limited knowledge on IP is based on what you read in the media, I'm begging you, please forget everything that you've read in the media about intellectual property law, because, again, 99.99% of it is wrong, right? Um, so, as an educator, so I have three law degrees and I don't practice law. Um, I am an academic at heart. I love teaching. Passion, that's my passion. Education is my passion. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit um, at the end about why education in IP is so important and the fact that we need to start not just in high schools, but at the primary school level. We need to teach creativity. We need to teach entrepreneurship and innovation. We need to teach intellectual property. We need to break the habit. We need to break the habit that every child needs to become a doctor, lawyer, or engineer to be successful. And I know I say this from a position of privilege that I have three law degrees, but the reality is, and I, I, you know, I'll, I'll give a personal story, so I have three law degrees. My brother is an event promoter. Guess who makes more money? <laughs> right? Um, so, even, and he works obviously with intellectual property. But the reality is out there. IP is the way forward. Whether you do it directly or indirectly, IP features heavily in your business. And the sooner that everyone realizes this, and the sooner that everyone educates themselves about IP, the quicker they can get to that 
sort of you know, proverbial end line of you know, making the money. And I know that at the end of the day, for a lot of people, it's just about the money. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But IP is the pathway to the money. When you think about all of the most recent billionaires in the world, guess how they got there? Not bricks and mortar, just intellectual property. Yeah? The Facebooks of the world, the TikToks of the world, etc. That's where the millions are made, or the billions in the case, as it is today. So I want to talk about five key themes for my presentation today. Uh, so the first one is demystifying intellectual property. So what is IP? I'm going to take you through that really quickly. Respecting IP. So when you know what IP is, only then we can begin to respect what intellectual property law is uh, and the value of it. And in understanding what it is and what, the value of, and what value it holds, we can then understand what we have. And the reality is that we don't really know what we have. So just quick show of hands here. How many of us own a piece of intellectual property? Every single hand in here should be up. Um, how many of you made a piece of macaroni art when you're in primary school? How many of you did a drawing, a watercolor drawing when you're in primary school? How many of you composed a poem? All of this is a copyright. All of that is subject to copyright law. You are all copyright, you are all authors. You all own some piece of intellectual property. And again, it might not be the greatest piece of work in the world. It may not be the case that you become a poet professionally, like we heard from Lionheart earlier, that you know, he's made his career in poetry. That might not be you, but the fact is that you own a piece of intellectual property. And again, when we understand what IP is and what we own and then figure out what we can do with it, you might realize that there are new avenues that you can pursue to make more whether it's more money, a more meaningful contribution to society, uh, or just you know, making for the sake of making. Yeah? We'll then talk about building the IP ecosystem, and I was really glad to hear from the Attorney General of Grenada's plans to um, build out the rest of the IP framework, um, and also about not just building out the new areas of IP that aren't uh, you know, currently on the legislature, but also re-looking re at some of the existing areas of IP. Um, and I'll talk about one piece that in the Copyright Act that I think needs to be re-looked at given the launch of the plan um, that was discussed earlier today. And then finally, I'll, I'll wrap up with talking about empowering the next generation, how we can use intellectual property to empower all of the people, not just Grenadians, not just Caribbean people, but everybody on the planet, how we can empower everybody to be more creative, uh, to make a, a greater contribution to society. So is everyone familiar with Lego bricks? Does anyone know where the Lego brick came from? What country? Denmark. In 1958, a patent was granted for the Lego brick. Lego has inspired entire generations of children, encouraged people to become architects, to become artists. I personally love Lego. And I want to use Lego as a theme for my lecture today, building bricks, blocks, if you want to call it that, and talk about how each element of IP is just one part of, of your brick house. And that more than IP, all of the different elements need to come together to create that finished product. So even if we know about IP, we have IP, and we know how to use IP, that's not enough. You need the bricks and you need the mortar, you need the cement to come together to make the house stand up. You need to have a solid foundation. Without that, you don't have a house that will withstand the rigors of, of life. Yeah? So currently, what we might think about intellectual property as is this sort of set of bricks and you can't really discern what's going on here. And when we start to understand the value of IP, start to understand what IP is, then we get more clarity. So following on with this image now, we see, again, more Lego bricks, but they're somewhat segmented by colors. And you will realize that there's some seepage in the colors here. And that's just to say that we shouldn't necessarily, as creatives, focus on the idea that we only have one type of IP, or that we only need one type of IP. Yeah? So what is intellectual property? WIPO gives us the most famous definition of intellectual property, and it, ref and it states, IP refers to creations of the mind, so things up here. And the first myth I want to tackle is the idea that all forms of intellectual property protect ideas. That's not necessarily true. That only relates, in a sense, to patent law, 
where patent law protects the invention, which is the idea that comes from your mind, but you still have to disclose that invention. So it still requires you to put it down on paper, right? So creations of the mind, such as inventions, which relates to patent law, literary and artistic works, copyright law, designs, which relates to industrial design rights, symbols, names, and images used in commerce, which all relate to trademarks. So as I said, if at the end of this lecture you take home nothing else, just understanding the difference between the different types, the copyright trademarks and patents, that's a success for me. That puts you in a much better place and a much stronger position. So what are the different types of IP that are traditionally available to us? The ones that are in green are currently already available to you for the most part in Grenada. Right, so that's copyright, trademarks, patents, image rights, and trade secrets. These are all available currently. The ones in red are the ones that need to be legislated for. Right? Design rights, geographical indications, plant breeders' rights, and increasingly there's a discussion about traditional knowledge. A lot of work is going on at the WIPO level right now about traditional knowledge. And as we all know in the Caribbean, we have lots of stories, folklore, traditional indigenous uh, contempor uh, knowledge that are being increasingly used in contemporary contexts. Uh, and that needs to be protected. There's a value in understanding our traditions and where we come from and our history and our identity. And, and there's an increasing push that intellectual property law recognize these things. So for most creators, you're typically going to be related to copyright and trademarks. Some of you may get into the realm of patents if you make an invention to do something better. Yeah? So you're an artist. You want to invent a new type of paintbrush. Think about it. A patent was granted for the ballpoint pen. How many of us use ballpoint pens? Every single one of us, right? It's one of the most simple things that we could think about, but back in the day before you had ballpoint pens, what did you have to do? You had to dip your feather in a bottle of ink, and then came uh, you know, calligraphy-style pens, yeah? And then someone came up with a ballpoint pen, right? So it doesn't have to be the fact that you're solving and curing cancer for you to get intellectual property rights. It could be something that solves a very, very simple daily task that you do in your life, or a very simple uh, part of the process that you have in your creati creative process. So it's not just the case that you're artist for artist's sake and you're creating artworks. Think about the other ways in which you can um, employ what it is you're doing in another context, changing the focus. Right? So think about whatever it is you do in your daily life and the sort of issues that you have, the things that are inefficient, the things that are problematic, the things that don't work, the things that you don't have. Think about our Caribbean context where it's typically very hot. Not everything function that is built or designed of, uh, functions well for us. Yeah? So start thinking about ways in which you can innovate in your little creative space. And you never know that thing that you come up with, that idea that you come up with here, when you replicate it and make it into something that's functional, that solves a technical function, you might get, be able to get a patent on that. Yeah? So trademarks. Trademarks is really just about branding. We can all come up with really great products, and the reality is that no matter how good your product is, if you don't market it properly and it's not branded properly, no one is going to ever know about it. No one is ever going to buy it. So all of the intellectual property rights work in tandem. It's, as I said, it's not the case that you just have a copyright, you just you know, you write a poem or you paint a painting and hope that it sells itself. Right? It's, that's not the way that it works. So I want to introduce you to a concept called the IP onion. Think about it like a typical onion. An, an onion has layers of skin, right? So multiple layers of skin. Each one of those layers is a different type of IP. So at the very core of our intellectual property onion, we have your product. That product could be something that's a patent, a copyright, a design, a plant, uh, plant breeder's right. It could be anything that you've created, right? So think about it as your core product, your core good, your core service, your core offering. That's the centerpiece. But that's not good enough in order to commercialize your intellectual property. That's not going to be enough to make you successful. In order to be successful, think about the most successful brands that you know, they all have an aesthetic to them. They all have a brand and a vibe to it. And, and in reality, we buy a lot of products because they represent who we are. We mesh well with them. They convince us by their advertising. They convince us by their story. Yeah? So, you have your core product, but you want to start designing the story behind that product. So, simple question. How many of us are iPhone users? How many of us are Android users? Why did you buy Apple versus why did you buy Android? Right? And it's always a typical question. So I'm an Apple fanatic. I have everything Apple. 
I like Apple because it's efficient. I like Apple because it doesn't break down as much. And I don't have to worry about the whole virus story. Yeah? But nonetheless, um, persons buy Android phones. So why are you an Android user versus a iPhone user? Why are you a Nike fan versus an Adidas fan? Why do you wear um, you know, particular colors in clothing? There's something about these aesthetic elements that draw us in. And we, the quicker that we start realizing that these things don't happen by chance, people develop these things with psychology behind them, develop things with anthropology behind them, with sociology behind them, with history behind them. We start realizing that these things are not happenstance. They're not uh, you know, just luck. They're all designed and targeted towards the consumers. So you need to create the story behind the product that you have. And then the final and the outer layer, and, this, and the reason why the outer layer, the red layer here, is your trademark, is because that's the first thing you interact with. It's the first thing you see. Before you put on that shoe, before you know whether that shoe is comfortable or not, before you know whether that shoe is going to fall apart or not, you see the name of the shoe. You see the logo of the shoe. So trademarks are increasingly important, right? That's the center of your business. If you get a bad reputation, no matter what you do, that bad reputation sticks with you. And so said, so done with brands. So why do we buy the particular brand of toothpaste that we buy? Why do we buy a particular shoe? Why do we buy a particular phone? It's because we associate with that particular brand. That brand has a reputation. That brand tells us a story. So trademarks are really important. Your story behind your product is really important. Your actual product is really important. Because we could say all of these things, if your product is crap, no one's going to buy it either. Yeah? So you have to hit all the targets on the intellectual property in terms of the IP onion. You have to hit all the layers in order to be competitive in the marketplace. So we need to start thinking about what it is that we actually have um, in order to really start figuring out how we can commercialize. But before we get into that discussion about how we understand what we really have and about IP audits and these sorts of technical things, I want to make a note here at this point about respecting intellectual property. Because the reality is that the world does not really respect intellectual property. Piracy is still at an all-time high. Yes, the availability of legitimate streaming services has uh, made a dent into intellectual property infringements. But the reality is that persons don't necessarily respect not just intellectual property, but also the creators of that intellectual property. How many of us know someone in the creative sphere that has had an artwork you know, lifted from them and just used by someone else without permission? How many of us has this happened to us where we've written a report and someone has taken our report and published it somewhere else? Has this happened to anybody here? And what do we do about it? Nothing? And again, this is why we need to start understanding better our intellectual property rights, understand what we can and can't do, and then we also need to talk about enforcement. Right? So we talk about enforcement in more detail coming down to the back end of the lecture. But it starts with education. And as I said, I'm an educator first and foremost. And for me, the battle really starts in the classrooms. If our children start understanding the value of intellectual property, what it is, and how to use it from earlier on, they will respect those rights and the people who make those rights in more detail. Just the same way that we teach our, we teach our children you know, the basic things. Don't steal, don't hit people, no spitting in you know, the classroom, and simple rules like that. Why is intellectual property not being added to that list of the typical things that we teach our children? Yeah? So it starts in the primary schools. I think we need to do more in that context. I know a lot of work is being done um, by the intellectual property um, offices across the region, but far more needs to be done in terms of um, targeting the younger children. And I know it might be difficult in terms of how do we explain these uh, complicated concepts to them, but you know, understanding the fact that creation has consequences, and in essence, these are positive consequences, and that there are rules related to the use of works. Because the reality is that children are now engaging with copyright works, with trademarks in greater quantities for longer periods of time. Everybody has a phone, everybody has a tablet nowadays. These children are also creating content on different things. Uh, think about games like Minecraft. People are creating copyright works on, 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 on games like Minecraft. Yeah? People are creating copyright works um, in you know, TikTok. Right? And, I, and again, maybe we shouldn't have our children using phones in that way, TikTok, Instagram, etc. But the reality is that technology is increasing at a rapidly evolving rate, and that 
people are using it. So we need to empower them to understand, not just for safety reasons, but to also understand what it is they're actually doing. Right? And when we do that, we can then start getting into other things that are really important, cybersecurity, uh, data protection, and these are all things that everyone needs to be aware about. So the next step for that is knowledge of the law. When we understand what IP is, we then need to start understanding what the laws are. And this is not targeted necessarily at the children, but this is where we get into the high schools now. Letting people know that there are laws about intellectual property and that anyone who is involved in creative um, enterprise understand what the laws are and we, you know, demystify the laws. Intellectual property is an incredibly complicated area of law. I am not going to pull any punches there and say that it's easy to learn. It is definitely not. If you ask me if I know every single thing about IP, I can tell you definitely not. There are certain things that nobody knows anything about. Um, and we could talk about that over a drink after for hours um, because there are tons of things in our copyright acts, trademark acts, and patent acts that nobody has any idea about. More so in the Caribbean where, unfortunately, we have not had a lot of jurisprudence, so a lot of areas of the IP laws remain untested. We don't know which way a court is going to go, and therefore we're playing Russian roulette if you bring a case in court. So if we understand what the laws say, if we're educated about the value of IP and what IP is, only then we can start respecting creators. And as I said, this, this starting point for respecting creators is understanding that intellectual property law leads to situations that can be legitimate employment. You don't have to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer to be successful in life. Being a creator can make you completely successful. As I said, my brother is a party promoter. My cousin does film. And, you know, they're arguably sometimes making more money than me, and I'm a lecturer in law with three degrees. So, what is IP exactly? IP is not just a means to an end, and I'll tell you that. IP will take you places, and I could vouch for this personally. Who would have known that I get a diplomatic welcome when I came into Grenada, and that's totally because of intellectual property law, right? Who knows, you could meet your wife, as I have, um, through intellectual property. So for me, it's about money. For me, it's about life and love. For me, it's about passion. It's my career. Intellectual property has you know, made my life. It's done everything for me. So it can also do that for you. But it's not just a means to an end. When you create, you don't just get property. It's so much more than that. Intellectual property should be seen as an investment. It's the same way that you buy a house as an investment property, etc you can consider investing your money in intellectual property instead. If you know that there's a creator doing really good artistic work or doing you know, really good stuff in film or doing really good music, why not invest in that business instead of buying a second house as an investment property? Or even in some case, if you don't ever want to buy a house, take that money and invest in intellectual property. Yeah? So it's an investment opportunity. It can create employment. It can create employment for the person who's actually creating, let's say, the artwork, the film, the music, um, authors, composers, etc. It can be an actual form of employment. Or it could be the case that your company is employing people to create. So now you are the person who's responsible for the creation of the content uh, at large, and you're benefiting from the creative output of other persons. So it can be a business opportunity. It can be a direct form of employment for you personally. And more so, it can also be used as security. And I want to touch on this point, because we mentioned it today in the conference that how do you value IP? How is it the case that if I create works and I want to go and get a loan, that I can't get a loan? And I'm glad that we do have a bank representative here today, so I'm urging the Cooperative um, Bank of Grenada to start considering security on IP. So instead of you requiring, let's say, collateral in the form of a piece of land or, or house, if, and Mr. Killer talked about it today, when Mr. Killer comes into the bank and wants to take a loan for a new creative project, we should be looking at things like his back catalog of works, right? We have artists. <laughs> we have artists in all forms. So whether you're a musician, performer, singer, songwriter, that have a back catalog of IP works. We have paintings that are worth more than houses. I'm sure that there are Grenadian artists, maybe someone in here, who may have sold a painting for that, that costs more than a house. Yeah? Well, if not, then the time is coming soon. Yeah? We see that there are artists that, when they pass on, their estates are worth hundreds of millions of dollars posthumously just because of the sole value of their music. That's the kind of money we're talking about with intellectual property. 
right? So we shouldn't be limiting ourselves to the traditional brick and mortar world that we were born and grew up in. We have to move and evolve with the times, yeah? That it's no longer the case that everything has to be about physical structures and more so with digitization, and we saw this with the NFTs, and I'll talk about NFTs in more detail because I am an NFT skeptic, right? I do believe in blockchain, but I am an NFT skeptic, and I believe that in looking at technology, we need to understand fully the technologies that we are dealing with. So I'll talk about AI, I'll talk about NFTs, yeah? But the reality is that we have to embrace technology, we have to embrace the changes in the world, and we have to evolve, and we have to grow, and the only way to do that is by embracing, again, intellectual property and intellectual property rights. So valuing your IP. So it's all well and good that I've said all of these lovely things about intellectual property, but at the end of the day, we know it comes down to dollars and cents. If it's not making money, it's not making sense. Yeah? So how do we value our intellectual property rights? So there are three traditional ways that they value it. I mean, I'm going to sort of just go through this in a very um, uncomplicated way, but the reality is that the way that you work all of this out is far more complicated, and anyone who has a law degree knows that law people are not good with numbers, right? So go to your accountants to have them sort this part out. And again, I'm making a call here, and I know the, dis uh, the discussion has started in Trinidad, I believe with one of the uh, finance houses um, to start working on a, a, a process for allowing local creators to come in and have their IP valued, Again, I'm pushing a call out here for um, the, the, re the relevant parties to start that discussion. So typically speaking, the, the firms that usually value intellectual property would be your Ernest & Young, your PricewaterhouseCooper, your international uh, accounting firms. They're the ones that typically value intellectual property. Right? But again, even then, it's not a very popular thing in the region. I don't know if it's being done anywhere. I haven't had any reports of that. Um, if anyone knows of it, please let me know after this, um, because that's something I'm interested in doing research on. But to get back here, three ways in which we can value our IP. So the simplest way, what did it cost you to make? How much money came out of your pocket? How much time did you spend, and what's the value of your time? So if you know that your time is worth $500 an hour, and you took $4,000 out of your pocket to buy the, the materials, whether it's, you know, let's say it's paint, or to buy an instrument or whatever it is, that's the cost of you creating that piece of IP. So that could be the initial value of it. However, just because you spent a lot of money to create something doesn't necessarily mean that the market is going to react in a similar fashion. So what, will, what is the market willing to pay? What's the demand for your product? So if you have high demand, obviously your price is going to be higher. And in order to get high demand, you're probably going to have, a, have, to have a strong brand, i.e. your trademark needs to be strong. And then, if that's not what you're going to use, i.e. the market approach, then you could talk about the income approach. So how much money have you made historically from your works? So not necessarily the particular piece that you're looking at here, but the other things that you've created in the past, how much money has this generally brought in for you? So it's usually probably a mix of these three approaches that we're going to look at in terms of valuing your IP. But you need to be able to start putting a dollar sign or a figure next to your work. And that might be difficult at the beginning because you know, you're an up-and-coming artist, you're an up-and-coming singer, you're an up-and-coming composer. Nobody necessarily wants to gamble on an unknown horse, right? But the reality is that, and again, it's like as a catch-22. Yes, you need to have a good product, but you also need to have a good brand, and that takes time. So patience is a virtue in this context. You need to be patient with it. And I'm not saying to give your work away for free. I'm not saying to devalue your work. But just like some of the speakers said earlier today, you need to sort of put your foot into the right doors. You need to get yourself into the right places, and networking really helps. So this is why I'm really, really happy to hear of the plans that Grenada has and that they're going to introduce this, because they're, op they're not just opening the doors, they're creating the doors for the creators. Yeah? And that's something that's very valuable. We can't necessarily say that all of the other governments in the region are doing the same for their citizens. So if I was a Grenadian, I would be very happy about what's going on and, and what is going to come in the future. And the reality is if this is executed well, Grenada springs ahead of everyone else in the Caribbean in this regard. And I want to compare what Grenada is going to embark on with what has gone on in South Korea. How many of you listened to K-pop 10 years ago? How many of you know a K-pop song now? I think everybody knows at least one K-pop song now, right? Everybody knows BTS? 
or Blackpink, or any one of the tons of other brands? Right. 10 years ago, who knew about those things? Nobody, right? Or very limited people, very niche. But you know what? What happened there? Government resources, commercial resources were put behind it, and they made a whole industry out of it, right? Netflix actually had a fantastic documentary on the creation and the sort of explosion of K-pop on the scene. And it, it was that sort of business oriented push behind the scenes that really made it blow up. Netflix released um, their latest uh, investment in uh, Korean films and TV series. I think it's something to the tone of $8 billion they decided they will invest in the Korean film industry. $8 billion. Because, and again, this is where the data becomes very important, last year the data suggested that 60% of Netflix subscribers watched at least one Korean TV series. So you can move from absolutely obscurity to being right in the limelight and everybody wanting to invest in you. And this is how it works in the real world. No one wants to back a horse that isn't already winning. So we have to make the best of what we have, pool our resources together, make the framework, and, and create the, you know, the infrastructure that persons can create. And once it starts to make uh, money, once it starts to be successful, all of a sudden, everyone wants to invest because everyone wants to back a winning horse. Yeah? So, like I said, I'm really, really impressed with the approach that Green Day is going to take. I mean, these are some of, the, some of the ideas that I saw discussed this morning or I heard discussed this morning. I've been playing with in my mind as to how you can use intellectual property to actually affect GDP, actually affect real trade, actually affect real lives. Because for me, I live in a sort of, you know, ivory tower for a lot of it, um, researching IP. But what I want to do is really show people that, you know, you can take this intellectual property, these rights, these laws, and make a difference in, you know, the real world lives of people. So we know what intellectual property is. We know how to value it. We know how we can use it. What do we actually need to do on a practical level when you have your intellectual property? What do you do when you're commercializing? What are the steps that you need to consider in order to get to the end line? Yeah? So the first thing you need to do, and you can use this as a checklist. So um, you know, take a picture, whatever the case is, and run through this checklist in your mind every single day when you wake up if, in relation to intellectual property rights. What's your product or service? What are you offering the world? And I'm saying the world because I'm not limiting this to you offering Grenadians, or you offering Caribbean people, or you offering persons in the Western Hemisphere. The, the world, because of the internet, is open. Yeah? So you could put your art up on the internet and sell it to somebody in Australia, or sell it to somebody in Japan, or wherever the case is. I've bought art from a person in India. I've bought art from a person in the US. And I've never met these people, and probably never will. So that's how it works nowadays. You can get, you know. Uh, commissioned artworks online and you'll never meet the people in your life. So what is your product or service? Is it a copyright? Is it a pattern? Is it a trademark? Is it a plant breeder right? What is it? So the first thing is identifying the type of IP that you have. When you identify what type of IP that you have, so which one, which one is relevant, right, you need to then figure out, do I own the IP? Just because you think you made it doesn't necessarily mean that you own it. And that's because, again, now knowledge of the law is essential. So, how many of us here are employees? Okay. Has anyone read section 28, subsection 5 of the Copyright Act? So, I'm going to paraphrase. Section 28, subsection 5 more or less tells us that if you create a copyright work in the course of your employment, guess who owns that copyright work? Your employer. And that's one of the legislative changes I'm going to suggest be made because I think that provision is out of sync with the whole push to be pro-author and pro-creator. Yeah? So you need to figure out, do I actually own the intellectual property that I'm working with? Because it might be the case that somebody commissioned you to do a work and you signed a contract. How many of you read the contracts that you sign? All right, definitely not enough people, right? You need to read all the contracts that you're signing. How many of you read the terms and conditions when you sign up for the platforms that you might be putting your works onto? YouTube, TikTok. <laughs> click accept, yeah? I know you don't really have a choice because it's either if I don't click accept, I can't use the service, right? 
I'll give you a story. There was actually one person who put in a terms and condition, a return address, and said, if you read this, send me a letter to this address. And they put, that person actually, in return, got $100,000. Because they gamble that nobody is going to um, you know, read this. And one person got the money. Right? So read your terms and conditions. So I'll give you an example again, YouTube. When you sign up to YouTube and you put your content on YouTube, you're actually granting YouTube a worldwide license to commercialize your work. So they can take your work and monetize it, and you, you may not be able to do much about it. Yeah, they'll have to pay you the, monet, uh, the monetization fee, um, but they can you know, take that and do what they want with it. Right? Everything that you upload on Facebook, you're granting them a license to use it. Yeah? When you take certain photographs at certain events, who knows what they're going to do with those photographs? And the reality is that, yes, while the photographer would be the owner of copyright, or will be the owner of copyright in most instances, should that necessarily be the case, right? So we need to start thinking about the different contexts in which uh, copyright works in particular are being created. And when I say particular context, it matters because who the owner is may differ from who the author is, or vice versa, yeah? So we establish what your product or service is, we know what IP rights are relevant. We know whether we own it or we don't own it. And if we don't own it, we need to get permission. Right? And just because we got permission to use it, it may still mean that you have to acknowledge who is the original author. Yeah? So moral rights also play a very strong part of this. And again, that's another area I would suggest very strongly uh, to relook at, because the moral rights provisions in the Caribbean are generally derived from a mix of the UK approach and the Berne Convention approach, which is pretty terrible on moral rights. Um, so what I would suggest in that context is that we make moral rights stronger to ensure that there's no waiver of moral rights, that the author, i.e. the artist who created it, the composer, the, the, um, you know, the performer, whoever it is, ensures that their uh, name remains on the work. Because in a lot of instances, you contract out of that situation so that the author does not have to be named. Yeah? What's your commercialization plan? So we figured out if we need to get a license, we need to get permission to use the work that we have. What's your commercialization plan? What do you plan to do with your IP? Just when you open a business, you have a plan. So it's the same thing with intellectual property. If you have IP, what's your plan? What are you going to do with it? Am I going to exploit it myself? Am I selling it directly to the market? Am I going to give it to somebody else to sell? Am I selling the original or am I selling copies? Am I going to print those copies myself, or am I going to uh, get someone to sell those copies to me? Am I going to franchise? Am I going to get a distributor? How is it all going to work? You need to have ideas about all of this, because this is going to require you to en uh, engage in contracting or agreements with third parties. And this is the crux of the matter. Contract, 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 contract. If you have any sort of IP, and you are working with third parties and you don't have a contract, you need to immediately look in the mirror, figure out what you're doing with your life, and start over. <laughs> because I don't care how good your work is, without a contract, you're just wasting your time. Right? Absence of a contract is the first step to problems. Right? So how many of you have you know, created an artwork or something, or a song, or worked with, collaborated with somebody, and you end up in a, in a dispute? And I know people might you know, not necessarily want to share with everybody, but I know it happens to everybody, right? Having a contract avoids or preempts some of these problems because everybody's on the same page at the beginning. Everybody knows what, the obliga what their obligations are, they know what to expect from one another, and if things go wrong, there are very clear procedures on what you can do or what you can't do at that point. So contracting is critically important. So I want to shift direction a little bit away from focusing on the IP itself and start talking sort of at a more broad level about the intellectual property ecosystem. So we, we have tons of super creative people across the region. And from today's uh, conference proceedings, I know that there are tons of super creative Grenadians and persons who are of Grenadian descent. But that's not enough. People will always create. Whether intellectual property laws exist or don't exist, people will create. However, that does not necessarily mean that they will get the best return on investment. That does not necessarily mean that they will be successful. That doesn't necessarily mean that any of this will work. 
It only works when we put all the bricks together. Yeah? So coming back to my earlier analogy about the bricks, we have to have not just all of the bricks together, we need to start laying them out, stacking them in the right way. So the first thing I'm suggesting is that you need to create an identity. What is it that we want from our laws? What is it that we need to create? What is it that we need to create efficiently or effectively? What do we want our laws to protect? What do we want our laws to say? What do we want our ecosystem to look like? Make it Grenadian. Just because you see a nice law in another country doesn't mean it's going to work for us or for you or for the region. Yeah? And too often we copy and paste laws and the laws don't fit the needs of the region. And this is very much a sort of uh, consequence of colonialism where laws have been imposed on us or even in the post-colonial sense, we are still indoctrinated by that law and we continue to impose their laws on ourselves. Right? So we need to figure out what is it that we need, what is, it that our, what is the uniqueness of our situation telling us, and what is it that we're going to do about it. So we need to change the laws to reflect our needs. Allocate resources. I don't need to say anything about this because Grenada is planning to do a fantastic job on this. The resources are being put aside. The infrastructure itself is being um, established. So I'm not going to have too much on that because it's going swimmingly well so far. Reforming laws and infrastructure. So again, the Attorney General mentioned that laws are going to be updated. Um, and I, have, you know, I probably have some more suggestions if I look through it in more detail. So I'm, I'm happy to engage with the uh, different offices to, to work on that. Um, but again, reforming the laws, ensuring that the laws that are being introduced are fit for purpose, not just because you know, this is the leading standard internationally or in the Western Hemisphere that we're going to copy or follow this or that. But again, we can have all of the right laws and all of the right things in place, but without changing the psyche, without ch revamping the thought process, we're not going to get anywhere. We need to break the sort of mental chains that we have on us and create what we want to create, not just create what everyone else is creating. We know that there is a demand for Caribbean culture and Caribbean products. Just create that. Don't necessarily feel that you have to change your product to fit the international market. And if the market is not ripe for us as yet, then we need to create that market. We need to put the groundwork in to make people want our things. Yeah? So people already enjoy certain things in our culture, like carnival, our music, etc. You know, piggyback on those things and see what it is about our identity that makes us uh, in demand. And, and you know, use those things as a sort of catalyst to start it, but build out broader into you know, the key things that are Caribbean or the key things that are Grenadian. And finally, talking about technology. Don't be afraid of the technology. We need to utilize it. It is absolutely essential that we, re that we are not just um, understanding the technology, but actively using it, and furthermore, developing on it. Things like artificial intelligence, which may not really be artificial intelligence in a true sense, um, it's probably more in the context of large language models because of the fact that the AI doesn't really think for itself. It's trained by using a data set. So it only can build on what the data set has in it. But are we part of the data set? And the answer is largely no. So we need to get persons in, who are in the, let's say, the data science, computer science fields to actively contribute to these things so that the AI reflects us or incorporates us as well. Yeah? So that's part of the process. We also need to acknowledge where certain things are not really what they seem, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Great idea in theory, but how it works in practice is probably not exactly the way that we think. Somebody in the conference earlier today mentioned an artwork that you know, wasn't particularly good that sold for $32 million of equivalent value. There's been a lot of fraud in NFTs where persons have been buying NFTs from one another. They actually tracked the amount of NFT sales and realized that nine, like, something like 90% of the sales were by 100 people in that vicinity. So they had a lot of inside trading in that sense of you know, pump the value of the Bitcoin or pump the value of the uh, Ethereum or whatever coin it is being traded on. We need to be careful with the technology. So it's not the case that because everybody is talking about it and it's a buzzword that we have to adopt it straight away. We need to be mindful of the technology that's being used, and we need to understand it, but we need to also embrace it. And we need to make it work for us again, because these things were not designed for us, so we have to redesign them in a way that works for us before we fully embrace them. 
So the next generation, right? And I just highlighted some people here that I came across um, who are in Grenada or from Grenada. So Crystal Lashington, who I've actually worked with, um, with her dance uh, business, doing great stuff. And what I want to say about Crystalline is uh, she reached out to me to get some IP um, you know, information. And that's something that is to be encouraged. We need to understand our limitations as to when we don't know something about IP or we need help in IP and seek, expert, uh, seek an expert opinion. Go to your lawyer. Go to your IP consultant. Get help. It's not about you doing everything on your own. I'm telling you, the money that you invest in getting proper professional help is going to save you a lot of headache and a lot of trials and tribulations in the long run. Yeah? Um, we have the Kalinago film. Um, we have the uh, Grenadian singer Jefferson Ramirez on American Idol. These are some things I got off the, creative, uh, the Office of Creative Affairs website, Glenda Cox. Um, I also just uh, plug here for my friends who are uh, Pintura, who do painting um, at, uh, right here in Grenada. Whether you're at the top of the game or you're at the very beginning, understand your intellectual property. Invest in yourselves. Invest in your intellectual property. And more so, I want to also celebrate the fact that there's, there are a lot of amazing women in Grenada doing a lot of amazing work. Keep that work up. But more so, let us also empower our next generation of Young, um, young girls, women, to also become part of the creative sector, right? We need to break down the barriers, the glass ceilings. Uh, we need to empower them to be able to do what they want to do, yeah? So encourage them to do what they need to do. So what I want to close up with is a question as to sort of an internal look. Who are you? And when I say you, I mean Greener. I'm not from Greener, so I'm not going to say we or us. Who are you, right? What is Grenada, right? The intellectual property developed in certain countries have defined those countries. If I tell you the country Estonia, what IP defines Estonia? Think before, all right, so what did we use before Zoom? Skype. Skype was a, a very, very large part of the GDP of Estonia. And they are kind of just known for Skype. What else do we know Estonia for? Not much, right? So the IP that you create can define your entire country. If we think about the US, what has the US contributed to us in terms of IP? When we think about IP and the US, automatically we think about what? We think of, well, so I see a number of things here. So we think about technology. We think about Amazon. We think about Google. We think about the movies, the Hollywood. We think about the music industry, right? And that is why when uh, Dr. Nurse showed us the figures earlier today, they are high up here, and we are still a little bit down here, yeah? So we need to figure out collectively as a Caribbean region what or who are we? You know, what makes us special? What can we capitalize on? So, questions for you. What is typically Grenadian? So, I know Alison spoke about Jab Jab, right? And that's apparently a, green, a very Grenadian thing. I don't know. Somebody have to teach me a little bit more about that, right? Uh, what does Grenada have a competitive advantage in, right? Is it Coco? Is it Carnival? Is it some other specific art form? So, start targeting any particular areas because the devil is really in the details. You need to be targeted. You can't just hit and hope. You need to start picking the areas that make the most sense financially at the beginning because not all are going to be successful in the long run. So pick the horses that are ready to race and start with those, and the others will follow eventually when you know, the money is flowing and you can divert resources in other directions. So an easy start is always picking the ones that are ripe and ready for exploitation. Right? Is the Grenadian ecosystem conducive to business and IP development? If I want to set up a business in Grenada, is it easy to do so? If I want to, to register my trademark, is it easy to do so? And not just if I'm from Grenada, but if I'm an international person and I want to come here and bring my money, I will set up my business to make use of the ecosystem in Grenada, how easy is it to do that? Yeah? And more than that, where does my contribution fit? Am I contributing to something that's a larger whole, something that's greater than me, something that's sort of, let's say, a national pride setup, something that's a part of a national enterprise, or is it really just about me? And it shouldn't be about the individuals, because everyone can grow here together and prosper together. So some closing thoughts. 
we need to decolonize our mindset. We need to do what we need to do and not focus on what we've been told to do in the past and not focus necessarily on what the colonizers suggest that we continue to do because they still suggest and con continue to suggest what we should do. We need to commit the resources where they're needed. And as I said, I don't need to talk to you all about this because Grenada is already starting to do that. We need to commercialize on our creative Caribbean identity. We are very creative people, but let's not waste our creativity by giving it away. Let's not waste our creativity by creating for creating's sake. Let us create and reap the rewards of that creation. It's too long and it's far too, you know, we, we've given up enough, right? It's time for us to actually make our mark and start collecting what, is do, what, what we deserve. And finally, and I want this one to, you know, if you have to go and get a tattoo today, go and tattoo contract on your hand, please. Right? Contract, 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 contract. Every little thing you do, have a contract. If you don't have a contract and you're dealing with a third party, even if that third party is your husband, your wife, your child, your grandmother, your neighbor, contract. Trust me, when you get nightmares, when you didn't contract, just, you know, you will see me in the back of your brain, should have done that contract. Right? So I want to leave it there for today. Thank you all for listening. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take all the questions here, um, as well as if you want to reach out to me um, after, my email addresses are here, and uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. I post a lot of stuff about IP. So thank you, Dr. Ku, for this uh, great lecture. And we want to invite some questions from the audience. Anyone have questions? Uh, there's, there's a mic. There's, there's a mic in, in the middle. So a, well, we'll have the lady first, and then we'll have you. So. Uh, good evening, everyone, and good evening, Dr. Ku. I really enjoyed your um, presentation. Um, my name is Tiffany. I run an IP company, so I register trademarks, patents, and copyrights in Grenada. And I also run a music services company um, where I also do those things, but also um, engage with the artistic world in terms of the business side of things. Something that I've um, encountered in my years of being in the music business is something that I've realized is that businesses do not pay their public performance licenses to play music. And it's creating a big dent in the creative economy because artists are having their music played in venues and radios and, you know, different places, but they're not seeing the returns when they check their PRO, PRO account, their performing rights, um, sorry, performing rights organizations for those yes. don't, who don't know. Um, so what is your take on that? And what do you think is a solution to that problem? Yeah, so excellent question. I have a threefold answer. So the first one is, why is it that people don't pay the CMOs or the PROs? Part of it is that people always question the legitimacy of the PRO or the CMO. Um, so for this region, it's Echo. Yes? Yes. Um, does Echo have an office here currently? Um, I'm trying. <laughs> right, so that's yes. part of it. There's no physical establishment here. Yes. The issue is not in the average person's face. And again, we come back to the education bit. People don't necessarily know that they have to pay the license for it. Um, people don't necessarily want to pay the license for it because they don't understand what they're paying for. They just think that I just have to pay this fee because I have to pay this fee. And that's not a good legitimate reason in the context. So we have to educate people about why it's important, who benefits from the money. The second part of the answer is that when the money is paid to the PRO, we have this issue in the Caribbean where a lot of artists complain bitterly that they don't get value for their money from the CMO, that when the money is paid into them, the checks that they get at the end of the day is not worth their time. Um, what I can say is that I'm working with WIPO and I've drafted a regional um, regulation on CMOs to govern transparency issues with and regulate them um, to ensure that they operate and function in an effective and efficient way. Um, that legislation is going to be with the governments soon, um, so the relevant ministers uh, will have to discuss it eventually to discuss, well, to figure out how and when they're going to implement it into their 
national law. So the third part of the answer is that we need stricter enforcement of uh, these rules, because ultimately, if you don't pay a license, then you're committing copyright infringement. So somebody would have to sue them ultimately. Yeah? If you don't sue them, you know, people are not going to pay. So you sue one or two, and then everybody gets the picture. When you realize that the bill in court is way more than the license that you should have paid, the message becomes very clear very quick. And to that leads my second question. Is it okay if I have a second question? Sure. Um, so right now, Grenada, I've read the copyright law very extensively, and right now we don't have a way to actually register copyright, not even with the Kaipo office. I've asked the deputy registrar of the Kaipo office if, um, how to register copyright, and she told me that it's automatic. It is. Right. But when you want to go in court to defend this infringement, how do you then say, this is my song? And like, well, in the US, and although we are signatory to the Berne Convention, mm -hmm. which means that if we register songs with the US Copyright Office, it's um, available in Grenada, it's protected in Grenada, not everyone could register with the US because some yeah. people might not have access to credit cards, which they use. Yeah. So how do we implement that structure in Grenada? Right now, right. what are your opinions so, about so that? So my, my personal view on it is that there's no need for copyright registration, and the reason I say that is twofold. One, copyright registration as it is already subsists, so this creates an extra level of bureaucracy which is not needed. Um, Article 5.2 of the Berne Convention actually prohibits the use of formalities, and it's been long argued that the requirement to register in the U.S. is actually in contravention of 5.2 of the Berne Convention. However, people tend to misunderstand the registration requirement in the US. It's not a requirement for protection. It's a, requ a procedural requirement in order to litigate your copyright infringement in court. Right. Um, so that's why I, I would argue that I don't see the need for it. The other problem is that just because you have a registration does not necessarily prove provenance. It doesn't mean that you made that copyright work, because you could have copied that copyright work and registered it, and then you get the registration, and you still copy the work. So it's going to always be rebuttable at the end of the day. So for me, personally, um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it just creates that extra level of bureaucracy. Um, but the value in it is that, you know, if you have this thing, it makes it seem like it's more legitimate, right? And something, you know, if you want to go to the bank with, the bank is going to ask you, well, you know, how do I know that this is actually yours? So my suggestion to you on that front is keep your records of your creation process and, and have it dated. Um, a lot of people refer to what is called poor man's copyright, and again, to me, that makes no sense because it doesn't prove provenance. All it does is indicate that on this day I came up with this, it doesn't prove that you didn't copy it from somebody else, it doesn't prove that someone, um, that, you know, you uh, created it actually on that specific day because you could have created it, you know, sometime before that. All right, so the, the poor man's copyright doesn't really help the situation either. Thank you very much. Sure, you're welcome. Thanks, Doc. Women and IP, acceleration innovation. So that was part, the second part of the question that you uh, spoke to, uh, the topic that you discussed. Have you seen any good examples that you can share with us where women have had or seen a tangible increase in their registering IP, for example, that you can help and if you share that with us, we ourselves can use that as a good example to motivate, encourage uh, females to be pa more participative in that industry. Yeah, so actually there's a lot of ongoing research right now um, coming out of, uh, so I know at least one person in the UK who has been focusing heavily on uh, registrations or creations by uh, female persons in particular because they were tracking it historically to say that there's a big gap between the, the, let's say the males and the females that are creating, so it's been traditionally male-dominated. Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, I can't necessarily, I can't point you to a particular resource at this time, but it's something, you know, let's talk after, um, you can send me an email, let me look into it um, to find some specific um, resources, but I, I believe, again, this is the reason why WIPO is highlighting this theme this year, the, to really say, look, we need to do more on this front, because even though it has improved, and with increasing access to, to education, more ability to go to university, um, you know, changing societal norms in terms of the role of the woman in the household or lack of, or not in the household, et cetera. Um, 
it's making an impact in that sense. But I don't think the data has necessarily hit that spot as yet. I don't know if uh, Dr. Nurse has any statistics on that off the top of his head. No? Um, but like I said, it's one of those areas that people haven't necessarily looked at. And that's probably part of the male bias involved in research in academia to start with. So again, the same problem cropping up over and over. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Can I ask one, one last question? Very short to the point. No, I just wanted to comment on the oh. last speaker, so you could just hold for one okay. minute. Um, on the issue of women in intellectual property, I think when WIPO came up with this um, theme for this year, it's targeted at getting women or encouraging women to become more involved and celebrating women's involvement. It may be that the issue of getting women involved in IP could be an international problem, maybe. In Grenada, interestingly, it may be quite different. As far as, let's say, trademarks are concerned, as in my office, and something that I intend to do more research into, I find that a large number of women have trademarks registered. It may be that we have more women uh, involved in trademarks. We're really saying trademarks. Many years ago, until 2012, if you had to register a trademark in Grenada, you had first to go to the United Kingdom. So it's what is called the re-registration of United Kingdom trademark. So you register the trademark in the United Kingdom, you present it to, in Grenada, and we re-register it. Of course, that is problematic. And uh, so the government then passed the Trademark Act uh, and enabled someone from Grenada to come directly to our office to register the trademark. Well, the very first Grenadian co company or business to register a trademark in Grenada is... Uh, De La Gridad, I believe, when we look at the records. And um, second, Western Hall Estate. But in looking at some of the records in my office, I, I only joined the office recently, I find that many, or many more women than men have registered trademarks. So we see that in Grenada, a lot of women, probably a, a greater percentage of women, are taking advantage of that. Um, we're looking at uh, industrial design legislation and we find that more women than men in Grenada are making inquiries. So it's interesting, and it is Her Excellency, the Governor General. She was giving a speech, no, not, <laughs> the MCC in La Grenada, was giving a, a speech to a group of women, and she mentioned that Grenada is a matriarchal society, and it's something that struck me, and I, I want to do more research on. So I'm saying all of this to say that that we're seeing women stepping forward and being part of this whole process of protecting the intellectual property, etc. So it's something we have to do some more research on to see what's happening. Probably patterns may be more problematic. We find that in the sciences, men are more engaged in the sciences, but as far as we is concerned, we see quite a lot of women taking advantage to register the trademark. Thank you. So we have um, Sir Peters. You may proceed. Yes, one short question. IP and folklore. We know that there are songs, myths, stories floating around the Caribbean for generations, yes. for centuries. I decide to do, or let's say, record a song which has been floating around. For instance, my friend from St. Lucia there, Bamo Atibo de Tibo. That's a song that's known by all the French speaking Caribbean countries. How that works with IP? Yeah, good question. So, um, the traditional issue with uh, folklore and IP is the fact that for copyright law, it, it doesn't protect the idea in itself, it, it only protects the expression of the idea. So if you record it in writing, you record it on film, you record it on a song recording, you get the copyright in the recording. Um, but then you have layers of copyright, where the first layer in that sense is the actual recording. The underlying layer is the work that was recorded. But because of the fact that the work is old and is, for, is, is part of the traditional knowledge or part of the traditional cultural expressions, that is traditionally not protected under copyright law. And more so the fact that it doesn't originate with you, you are not the author of it. The author might be somebody hundreds of years ago. Um, so what is being increasingly recognized is that these things have cultural value and uh, sort of transcend the existing intellectual property framework. So WIPO is currently working on a, well, they've been working on it for some years, maybe decades actually, uh, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural um, expressions, protection. 
to grant special protection to these things. So it's a sort of sui generis framework of, of a sorts. Um, we actually have persons from the Caribbean who, who, working, who are working on this. So uh, Dr. Sharon Legall, who was at UE St. Augustine, um, I believe Dr. Marcus Goff out of uh, Jamaica is also in, in that field. So we do have persons in the region who are working in this area. Um, but what you will get from the recording is that you own that specific recording. So you get the people together, they play the music, they sing, the recording of it is, is, is subject to your copyright. However, you can't stop, let's say, somebody else coming and sing the exact same song. They get a separate copyright in that recording, right? But you can't stop somebody else from singing the exact same song or making the same performance. Yeah. Hi, good, good evening. Um, my name is Haran Forto. I'm a photographer, content creator, and videographer. Um, my question is in regards to a statement you made earlier mentioning the um, certain banks, like you'd lean towards banks and other lending institutions to um, utilize intellectual property towards use as collateral. Yes. Um, how do you, would you suggest um, creating them, making them more aware or more open to those aspects of utilizing intellectual property in terms of my, of content, so I would have like, let's say, historical photos that are priceless. Yes. How could I put that in a reputable way so that the bank would accept that? Would it be organizations like WIPO, would they be able to assess that and say, based on the international standard, these works are, are worth X amount of dollars? So I could bring that to the bank as a more weighted yeah. statement until they're able to get the um, understanding of how yeah. much the work is really worth. Because a lot of organizations, as Mr. Killer mentioned earlier, they don't really take that sort of work seriously. It's not even that they don't yeah. take it seriously. If you go in the bank with it, they'll laugh at you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they'll actually laugh at you. Um, so that's a really good question. And, and, and it's a difficult one to answer because you have an institution that is assessing you on the basis of risk. At the end of the day, they want to know, are you, one, a good customer, and two, if you default, what can I get from you to then cover the debt? And traditionally, they have not seen intellectual property as being valuable in that sense. And it's in part lack of knowledge and lack of education about the setup. If people understand the value of the IP, then it, you know, it will be very different. How do we begin to engage with that? I don't have an answer to that question as yet. It's something I've been playing around with um, mentally. So what's the starting point to get banks to think about this? But to answer the first part of your question, um, WIPO wouldn't get involved in something like that. You'd have to go to an accounting firm that does valuation, um, that is trained in valuing IP. So typically, it's one of your international um, accounting firms like Price, what, um, yeah, PwC, um, Ernest & Young, those kinds. They, they would be the ones that have those services readily available. Um, what is increasingly becoming the norm now, however, is the valuation of startup companies. Banks are willing to take the risk on a startup company when they get the evaluation. I don't see that as being any different in terms of valuing IP, because a lot of the times with these startup companies, the valuation is rooted in the IP. So what some persons actually argue is not so much evaluation of the IP that's important, but rather the valuation of the business behind the IP, or the potential commercial valuation of the whatever enterprise you can do with the IP. So you can get around it in that way to say, look, I'm a photographer, I take photos all the time, I have stock photos, I generate, this amount of money on a regular basis, and on that point, you can lend me this money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and in addition to that question, are there any other countries, regionally or internationally, um, that lending institutes are applying that sort of collateral system with IPs? So yet? you'd see in the developed world, they're a lot more willing to take those kinds of risks, and then you have a lot of banks that are more willing to take risks on startup companies. Not the best time to talk about this with the fall of the couple banks in, um, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank, etc. So maybe not the best time to talk about this. But um, you know, there, there are there are institutions that are willing to take those risks like that. Yeah. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, let's talk. <laughs> I, for over 20 years, I've been enjoying the profits of playing music for Calypsonians, soca artists. And I listen to them cry because we, the band men, go home with the money. And they cry that they come every year. Over 30 years they're doing this and they get nothing. They have nothing. 
And we've seen the attempts of uh, several CMOs right here failed. And now we have artists, the season is up again. Some artists are afraid to release their songs or put their music certain places because in their minds they are thinking they deserve some form of copyright. So let's talk copyright, the related rights, and what can the policymakers do to encourage and open this space for artists to start involving and engaging for Grenada? Yeah, um, so good question. And part of the problem is the divide between performers and authors. And a big part of the problem in the Caribbean traditionally has been the fact that our C CMOs, the collective management organizations, have been focused on the authors and composers and not on the performers. So one of the issues that need to be addressed there is from their end that they need to set up the infrastructure to actually account for the money that's coming in from or for the performers. So that's, that's the first bit that needs to be addressed there. Um, I think you probably also need to, again, look at the Copyright Act and ensure that the Copyright Act is sufficiently protecting performers. Um, not all of the Caribbean countries have adopted the Rome Convention, for example, in its full form. Uh, so that's something I haven't looked at in terms of Grenada specifically. So I'll, I'll refrain from talking specifically about the Grenadian context there. Um, but I know, like, in some of the other countries, they've pushed the performance rights a little bit upward. So even though the minimum rights at the international level are here, they've gone a little bit above to say, look, performers, their contribution is worthwhile, they should you know, be entitled to a little bit more. Um, so the other thing is contract, contract, contract. When the band members set up with the, um, the artists, make it very clear what the arrangement is. Are you a daily set musician getting a standard fee and then you go home, or are you getting a share of the music that's being created? So negotiation skills also come into play here. If you know you have the hottest band in the island and everybody has to come by you to get the beat that they need, you have leverage. Take that leverage and argue not for upfront payment, but rather argue for I want a share of the copyright. I want piece of the copyright. You know? So just because you didn't necessarily create in that way doesn't mean that they can't give you piece of the royalties. So it's about being forward looking as well. And again, we talked about this today, forward looking. Don't just think about me playing today and getting $10 for tomorrow. Think about the fact that a song, a copyright in a song could last for 70 years um, after the death of the author and you could be earning revenue if that song is a hit for the rest of your life and for part of your, um, you know, your, next, your, your children's lives, etc. Yeah. Good evening. I have a little, uh, maybe a challenge, or if you want to say a problem. I have a product that's been sold on Amazon without my consent, and I've been trying for quite a few years, whether through London, um, Utah, California, to address that issue. And to date, um, no assistance. I, I've reached out to um, the local institutions in Grenada and so forth. Yeah. And um, I, I've registered with um, the CARICOM desk of an ISBN number and so forth. You mind sharing and what type of product it is? It's, it's a book. OK, so you've written a book. I've written a book. And um, I was able to trace someone through some parts in the US selling used products are fine, but you also have new ones. And some have been sold uh, at 600 US, over 1,000 US, and so forth. Yeah. And um, I'm not receiving one cent. So, yet okay. for, so those books, um, are they legitimate copies? Or you can check it. It's called Forts and Coastal Batteries of Grenada. And I, I learned recently, too, that um, our late um, dear friend, Beverly Steele, had had the same problem as well, too. Her books have been sold on Amazon and without her consent, and um, yeah. we don't know where the money is going. Yeah, so, so when we speak about intellectual property rights and you know we need to produce and so forth, sometimes you know yes, but who is helping the Caribbean? Yeah, I so um, part of the issue there is jurisdiction because it's taking place on Amazon, which will be under U.S. law. So all of the agreements that you sign up, I'm guessing this is the American Amazon store. Um, the jurisdiction. I, I, I've never signed nothing to anybody. No, no, what I'm saying is the persons who are selling it there, the first part is the jurisdiction there. Uh, the Caribbean entities don't necessarily have any uh, remit to act on your behalf because it's outside the jurisdiction. So that's the first issue. The second thing is you need to establish whether the books that are being sold are legitimate copies or are they um, subsequent copies that have been printed after the fact of your initial run. Because then that's a whole other issue of infringement. Mm -hmm. Right? So. If it is the case that they're legitimate copies that were, sold, that were made in the first run of the book, 
and are being sold on Amazon, you need to figure out, is it the publisher that sold this to a third party? Because if that's the case, then the distribution right was exhausted and they're entitled to sell it on Amazon. Well, I'm in a predicament because um, the first book is just a snippet of a big book. Mm -hmm. Should I republish that later copy? Or should I change the name or something? Because someone advised me that if I publish a new um, edition, then the old one becomes a collector item and then it will be more expensive than a new one. So, you know. Yeah. Um, I feel like we, we can talk. We can talk. Um, we can uh, talk. We can talk. We can talk. <laughs> I feel it's a very complicated I matter. I solutions. I, I, I've been, I've been, you know. Yeah. You'll have to give me the full story because I feel there's, um, there's more at play here. The interesting part about it is a religious organization out of, I wouldn't tell which state, that's yeah. selling the product. Is it Utah? Not Utah. I tried to get through Utah, but it's not Utah. Um, okay. But we can chat after. We can chat after. Good evening. Uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> Mr. <laughs> he, he may need a lawyer, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and one with three law degrees. Yeah. Yes. Good night. So, and thank you for a wonderful lecture. Very uh, educational and inspiring as well. So since you said contract, 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 my question to you is, does WIPO have standard form contracts, best practices that all of the creatives and the persons who are producing intellectual property can find online to help them? Because I can tell you, I used to be a lawyer, and um, for an average person starting out... It's prohibitive. They, yeah, they can't even enter the lawyer's office. Yeah. So, you know, and I think you take the example of the bands, people playing bands and the artists and that sort of thing. They're not going to go to a lawyer to get a contract yeah. done, and even yeah. if they attempt, it's probably... They'll draft something of themselves that probably isn't going to really help them. It may actually be worse. So to me, if, if, if WIPO, so that's the first question, perhaps I should let you answer. Yeah, so um, the short answer is I don't think that WIPO has templates, but this is something that uh, Grenada Office of Creative Affairs can consider building a bank of templates. I mean, it will be an expense up front, but I think if they create the, the bank of templates um, and then offer some education on basic contract drafting, because in most jurisdictions, you don't need to be a lawyer to draft a contract unless it's under um, deed or seal, so um, any, any individual can draft it if they have the right knowledge. Um, so that might be something to add to the list of to-dos. Um. <laughs> right, well then you, you've kind of um, leapfrogged the second, uh, I don't know if it was gonna be a query because that was gonna be my, my thought as to whether to help persons, uh, and in that case it's probably the vast majority of creatives in Greenland who would need assistance yeah. with contract, 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 that in fact we would have to create the template uh, and do the education and then make it readily available so that when persons are going about in their day-to-day -day creative life, they can in fact yeah. have the, the contract. So that was my, my key question. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So I just want to add one, one more comment on that point. Um, contracts are really important, but we need to also understand that contracts have evolved now as well, so you don't need to write in legalese. You can write in very basic, simple English, and that's the best way to contract, actually. The modern form of contract drafting is as simple as possible. So, um, you know, offering some education as to how to draft a simple agreement, I think, is something that needs to be done. Good evening, Dr. Kuhl. Good, Good evening, evening, everyone. Hard act to follow, um, the Honorable Prime Minister. But as the um, very proud daughter of the honoree this evening, the late Carol Bristol QC, I, I think I stand on solid ground. Um, my question goes to really about protecting the small man or woman. When we, you spoke about Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, and putting your images out there and you ask, do we read the terms and conditions? I try. But like you say, most of us just don't read or we give up. Yes. Because it's so long, so complicated, so convoluted, typical legalese, yes. and nobody can figure it out. And you know that they have you. Why can we not figure out a way to legislate so that they do not have the right 
to take away our copyright, our trademark, our business, and make it theirs. We need to find a way to protect the individual citizens of our country. So how do we do that? And why can we not do it? Yeah. Why has it not been done? To me, it's simple. You just tell Facebook, you can't do that to my citizens. You can't have it. And that's it. No? So, I mean, I guess the easy answer to that question is that it is possible, maybe along drafting of unfair contract terms, for example. So you have many unfair, unfair contract terms act to say that, look, these sort of provisions by social media companies, et cetera, mm -hmm. prohibitive and or oppressive and therefore outlawed in the jurisdiction. So that's an easy answer to the question. Mm -hmm. The longer answer and a more complicated answer is the fact that when you sign up for a service like Facebook, like Instagram, like TikTok, if you're not paying for it, then you are the product. Um, so the trade-off there is that you get to use their platform and you become their product. So they will argue, well, you're signing up for this. However, they have acknowledged, at least in the EU, that there is a value, so-called value gap between mm -hmm. the social media companies or technology companies using the, the works of individuals and monetizing them in different ways um, and attracting people to come to their platforms to see these things that are being put up, these user-generated contents being put up. Um, and what they're saying is that, look, you, it's unfair to the creators of this content. Mm -hmm. So they have introduced new legislation on the Digital Services uh, Market Act, uh, which came in in 2019, Article 17 in particular, so that where copyright works are being communicated to the public by these uh, sort of online platforms, they have to pay a license fee to use Excellent. those works. So that is fairly new legislation coming out of the EU. Um, haven't seen it prop up anywhere else, because in every other jurisdiction, as long as the user signs the terms and conditions, they sort of say the intermediary has no liability because you've signed over, you know, the ability for them to do those things. Yeah. Right, but we can't take that away. And, and I think we should. So I hope Attorney General is listening. Well, that's a policy decision. <laughs> yes, because we need to do that. We need yeah. to protect our individual citizens. And Grenada is showing itself to be a leader you know, on the world stage in this, if not in the Caribbean. So I'm hopeful. Thank you for the yes. lecture. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. So Ms. Silla will, will take your question, okay. but um, I'm afraid we'll have to, oh, um, after you, um, that'll be the federal question for the evening. Thank you. Yeah, well, I feel bad now because this is not really so much a question <laughs> as um, in defense of banks, because this is something I hear a lot. The complaint that I can't take my picture, I can't take my catalog, or whatever other expression. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it's not that the banks will laugh you out of town, it is that the banks are operating within a regulatory space and a framework. Yeah. And if the loan goes sour, and the fellow with the fabulous painting defaults on his loan, and the regulators come around to ask questions about what happened in this transaction, there'd be a hammer laid on the bank. I want to suggest that the opportunity we have for Grenada, we are also operating within a, a regulatory framework in a sub-region, which is the yeah. OECS. Yeah. So this may present a fantastic opportunity. If we're taking the lead and we're putting the resources to move this in the right direction, we may also want to consider taking the lead in moving that sub-regional organization, which governs our banking industry, yes. to come up with a community standard, a common understanding and method of valuation, so that, because a single bank in Grenada by itself cannot take the lead on this. Yes. This has to be OECS driven. So I would like to suggest that twinning with this initiative, because a lot of work and effort and money is going into this, and if at the end of the day, Mr. Photo still can't walk with his fantastic photograph to a bank and have it recognized and have it accorded some value that a bank can use as part of its assessment of whether he's a good risk for a loan, then we're halfway there. Yes. So it's not the Grenada Cooperative Bank or any other bank yeah. in Grenada yeah. that can go out on a limb on this. This is something that has to be moved at a regional level, and I want to throw out the gauntlet to the Grenada government. If we're taking the lead in this aspect, we may want to also nudge, as a sub-region, the banking sector to rethink and reimagine, I think that's a word Dr. Grenard has coined, <laughs> reimagine, how we treat the issue of valuing, and our laws have to also come up to speed because we are very archaic 
concept still as to what constitutes property. Yes. And all of that has to be moved along. Yeah. So, sorry, it's not a question, but <laughs> yeah. I thought I would just add this. And, and that's why I'm using the analogy of the BRICS. It has to be all of the BRICS coming together. And it's the company laws, it's the banking regulations or the banking laws. It's also your tax laws, because when we start to make all of this money, how to pay tax too. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ku. But before I ask the chairperson to um, take charge of the proceedings going forward, the issue of asset valuation, it's probably something that my office can um, present to, to WIPO. Um, if there is interest, um, the gentleman who asked the question, and through the Bankers Association, we could probably um, co convince a meeting or a workshop, get an expert from WIPO to come to Grenada, do it by Zoom, through the Bankers Association, probably start some initiative like that in, in terms of getting that whole issue of um, asset valuation to be discussed. So I invite now um, the chairperson. <laughs> I hope I could coin that as intellectual property. <laughs> okay, thank you so very much. Let us give Dr. Ku a very happy <laughs> And I also want to thank all of the persons who asked questions. At this point, we are going to be Santa Claus in May. So I call on Dr. Nicole Philip Dow to join me on stage. And first ask our favorite, uh, sorry, I wouldn't say it out loud. One of our most distinguished alum, Dr. Leo. <laughs> The Honorable Deacon Mitchell to come to the stage. We are celebrating 75 years, and it is a special gift for the Prime Minister. I now call on Minister Claudette Joseph to join us on stage. Thank you, Minister Joseph. I now call on Dr. Ku to join us on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so very much. At this point, I call on Janae Greenwich. Our secretary, the UE Open Campus Student Gill, to do the vote of thanks. Thank 
pleasant afternoon to everyone. I know protocol has already been established, but permit me to recognize a few individuals. Deputy Governor General and President of the Senate, Her Excellence, Honorable Decima Williams, Honorable Deacon Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada, Senator the Honorable Claudette Joseph, Attorney General and Minister for Legal Affairs, Labor and Consumer Affairs, other members of Cabinet, the family of Carol Bristol QC, Mr. Larry, Larry Lawrence, Managing Director, Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited, members of the Legal Fraternity, Dr. Justin Koo, members of the UE Family and Education Fraternity, in special invited guests, well-wishers, friends, members of the media. According to James Arling, no duty is more urgent than giving thanks. I am Janae Greenwich, the incoming chapter chair for UE Open Campus and Regional Gales Secretary. I am truly honored having given the noble task of expressing thanks to all those who have contributed to the success of the eighth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. From the onset, I would like to express thanks to the University of the Westernese Open Campus for hosting yet another successful Distinguished Lecture Series under the theme, Using Intellectual Property Tools to Create Value for Entrepreneurs in the Creative Industry, Women and IP, Accelerating Innovation and Creativity. Deputy Governor General and President of the Senate, Her Excellence Honorable Decima Williams, thank you for being present at this Distinguished Lecture Series. Prime Minister Honorable Deacon Mitchell, Alumni of the University of the West Indies, we express our profound appreciation to you for recognizing the significance of this event by your presence, thus contributing to the success of this event. Attorney General and Minister for Legal Affairs, Labor and Consumer Affairs, Senator the Honorable Claudette Joseph, Thank you for agreeing to give brief remarks and gracing us with your presence. Dr. Justin Koo, WIPO Regional Consultant, lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine, who has been bestowed the wondrous task of featured guest speaker of this evening's event. Dr. Koo, we appreciate your presence, and most importantly, this fantastic yet timely lecture on the theme. This lecture did not simply provide us with knowledge, but forced us to reimagine our efforts to determine creative ways to utilize intellectual property in this ever-changing and innovative world. Therefore, Dr. Ku, I solicit the cooperation of everyone here, in person and online, to say gracias. Thank you. Nothing is possible without God. As such, it is most fitting for me to express thanks to Father Marcin Rumik for leading the invocation. Sincere thanks to all the other government ministers, permanent secretaries, and other senior government officials for accepting the invitation to be part of this lecture series. Dr. Francis Rimpro, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the West Indies Open Campus, and other UE officials who joined us online. Thank you for being part of this event. Please be assured that your presence has certainly contributed to the success of this event. The family of Carol Bristol QC, in whose name this event is staged, because of his unwavering contributions to the legal fraternity, we extend a special Thank you for allowing us to honor his contributions. <laughs> this event could not have been possible without the incredible collaboration of our esteemed sponsors, including the University of the West Indies, Grenada Cooperative Bank, 
who has sponsored this lecture since it started, Kaipo. Kaipo, WIPO, and the Ministry of Legal Affairs, Grenada Office of Creative Affairs. It was a pleasure working with everyone, and thank you for coming on board and helping us pull off such a timely lecture series. Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, Direct, Deputy Director, Acting OCCS UE Open Campus, thank you for your brief remarks. Keisha Kamajan Branch, Head Acting UE Open Campus Grenada, I express thanks to you for, your, for directing and coordinating, also navigating us through this evening's proceedings. Register at Kaipo, Mr. Robert Branch, thank you for introducing our guest speaker. To Tero, who played our national anthem so superbly, thank you for making a difference or adding a difference to this lecture series. To the members of UE Open Campus and TAMCC staff of the Ministry of Legal Affairs and Kaipo, Grenada Bar Association, St. George's University, principals, lecturers, teachers, and students, the media, creators, and presenters at the conference, please be assured that your presence and participation have contributed immensely to the success of this event, and for this, we are eternally grateful. Special thank you to the management and staff of Radisson Grenada Beach Resort for allowing us to host this event in your elegant and comfortable conference room. As the French will say, merci tout le monde. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Greenidge. At this time, we, have, we do have a short uh, cocktail outside plan for our guests. So we probably would ask us to stand as the Deputy Governor General exits and the Prime Minister exits. And thank you all so much for coming. Prime Minister, pleasure, thank you. Introduces e payments, our new e banking feature that allows you to make payments online hassle free. Save time by paying your bills online. Transfer money to accounts at other local and regional banks. Send wire transfers on the go to anywhere in the world. Or send money to friends or family using Buddy Payment. E payments. The swift, simple, and secure way of transferring money. Welcome home. We set out to build something. Not for us, but for you. In 1932, we set out on a mission to establish an institution that catered to the financial needs of every Grenadian. We envisioned a space where our people felt secure and welcome to do business with familiar faces. This was more than a commercial enterprise. Because we considered you to be family, we saw ourselves as building more than just a bank. We likened this establishment to a house. Since we opened our doors in 1933, you've remained with us ever since, growing with us and saving with us. But most importantly, 
trusting us to safeguard your interests. Through unrest and turmoil, you put your faith in us to be the shelter against adversity. Your trust is the foundation upon which we continue to build to provide stability and support for your dreams and aspirations. Your trust helped our family to grow. And as we grew, your needs grew in tandem. So we developed, expanding our accommodations to make you comfortable, transforming our humble abode to a modern center of business and commerce, while preserving our warm, friendly, family atmosphere. As we furnished our house with efficient services, you decorated our offices, walkways, and counters with smiles, love, and satisfaction, giving us the impetus to improve and do more. It took vision to build this establishment, and our vision has always revolved around the well-being of our people. It is vision that continues to guide our development, a vision of growth, a vision of expansion, a vision of the future, a vision that recognizes that the world is a global village and that technology has become an integral part of our lives. A vision that embraces the efficiencies of technology and its importance in diversifying our corporate and retail portfolios. A vision that represents your vision, your interests, and your needs. You see, we built a house, but it didn't take us long to realize that people, our people, make it home. Welcome home. Co-op Bank introduces e-payments, our new e-banking feature that allows you to make payments online hassle-free. Save time by paying your bills online. Transfer money to accounts at other local and regional banks. Send wire transfers on the go to anywhere in the world. Or send money to friends or family using Buddy Payment. E-payments the swift, simple, and secure way of transferring money. Welcome home. We set out to build something. Not for us, but for you. In 1932, we set out on a mission to establish an institution that catered to the financial needs of every Grenadian. We envisioned a space where our people felt secure and welcome to do business with familiar faces. This was more than a commercial enterprise. Because we considered you to be family, we saw ourselves as building more than just a bank. We likened this establishment to a house. Since we opened our doors in 1933, you've remained with us ever since, growing with us and saving with us. But most importantly, trusting us to safeguard your interests. Through unrest and turmoil, you put your faith in us to be the shelter against adversity. Your trust is the foundation upon which we continue to build to provide stability and support for your dreams and aspirations. Your trust helped our family to grow. And as we grew, your needs grew in tandem. So we developed, expanding our accommodations to make you comfortable, transforming our humble abode to a modern center of business and commerce, while preserving our warm, friendly, family atmosphere. As we furnished our house with efficient services, you decorated our offices, walkways, and counters with smiles, love, and satisfaction, giving us the impetus to improve and do more. It took vision to build this establishment, and our vision has always revolved around the well-being of our people. It is vision that continues to guide our development, a vision of growth, a vision of expansion, a vision of the future, a vision that recognizes that the world is a global village and that technology has become an integral part of our lives. A vision that embraces the efficiencies of technology and its importance in diversifying our corporate and retail portfolios. A vision that represents your vision, your interests, and your needs. You see, we built a house, but it didn't take us long to realize that people, 
our people make it home. Welcome home.